Yo, let's go. Check, check, check. What's up? What's up, y'all? Let's do a little day streaming. Today, we're doing Cormac McCarthy's brand new book, published 10 days ago. Uh, it's called The Passenger. And we're going to be covering this um, pretty in-depth, I mean, as, as in-depth as we can, um, uh, with no analyses really out yet. So, you know, this may be the first... Um, it's not the fr I'm sure it's not the first analysis out there since it was published, but um, we're going to do our best with this one. We've covered Cormac McCarthy before. We did um, we did Blood Meridian, of course. We did No Country for Old Men. And uh, shouts out also to uh, Real Cooter Brown out there, Kootsky, uh, Maddie at Digital Minefield. That was a fun stream last night, so go and check that out. Um, yeah, and also go back and watch the Blood Meridian and the No Country for Old Men streams. That was fun. Those were fun. So this is um, this was published October 25th. Uh, Cormac McCarthy's 89 years old, and this is a really a diptych because... This book was just published, and I got the dog sitting here right beside me. So it's going to be a fun little day stream. It's called a it's called a little day streaming, y'all. We do a little day streaming, and um, hopefully the mic is is doing okay, y'all. I'm still working with the levels, so forgive me if you know the 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 mic is is not up to par. But we're we're doing the best we can here, y'all. And I've seen a couple of you know reviews of the book. I've, I think I've read all the reviews of the book, but I haven't really seen any um, deep dives. <laughs> Pun intended, because the book covers uh, scuba, um, wreckage diving. It's, it's sort of the plot hinges on that. And so we're going to deep dive into the plot. Um, of course, those are book reviews. We're not doing a book review here. We're doing an analysis. And, uh, of course, the difference is that I'm not telling you whether to buy the book or not. It's not really my interest. I'm not even going to – I'm not really even going into that much about whether I like the book or not. Um I'll, I'll, of course, go into that. I mean, it's a subjective stream, but but we'll be um, analyzing the worldview within the text, looking at the original text, and look at some, looking at some of the passages, comparing it to other Cormac McCarthy works, and talking about him as the, the uh, great American writer. I will say, in my opinion, you know, he is, um, if not the great American writer, I think he's one of the great, you know, one of the great living American writers. Of course, we've covered Don DeLeo. Uh, we just did Mal 2. Go and watch my Mal 2 stream. Uh, this is sort of on a postmodern theme, and we're discussing uh, what postmodernism is and sort of the broken landscape of the wasteland of the wasteland of the outer dark of human wreckage that occurs in the text in pretty much all Cormac McCarthy's sort of a through line through Cormac McCarthy. This book is a lot different than the other books in a number of ways. So I'll be going into that and I'll be talking about the narrative, the plot, um, the syntax, the diction, the structure of the novel, the worldview. Um, the book covers a lot of ground and all, all McCarthy works. The language is so, can be so complex. That's one of the great things about, you know, he's, he's almost a prose uh, poet. And the, but I will say that the 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 language of this is a lot different. It's a lot more simplistic in a number of ways, and I think that one of the things about this book is that it it really has more normal characters than we're used to seeing in McCarthy works. And of course, I'll talk about what that means as we go on. But the themes and some of the uh, some of the plot lines are are pretty complex, heady stuff. Um, we're talking about physics, mathematics, um, the, the, the narrative and the dialogue within the book goes into all sorts of, they go into, you know, expertise on every subject, car fixing, um, digging gold, treasure hunting, um, psychiatrics, but none of that, we're going to discuss what that means in the book. And I think that my interpretation is going to be slightly different than than other analyses to come of this book. Of course, like I said, this is probably you, you might be hearing this first. I could see this book being made into a film because it's it's written in a quasi cinematic style, like like uh, No Country for All Men was. So uh, <laughs> Jeff says Headley Headley Lamar. So um, we're going to be going into that. Hope everybody's having a good day, and please make sure that you. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that sub button if you haven't already. Um, share share the streams if you want to, if you have the inclination. I appreciate it. Uh, leave comments. 
I love the comments. Also, leave comments when you're done, um, especially if you you're if you leave opinions about the book. If you think the book is garbage, then just don't just say so. Give me your opinion. I'll read it. Um, and I love to hear other people's opinions about the work. Um, of course, backed up by reason, logic, evidence, fact, um, and um, and whatever you happen to find uh, anal analytically about the book, rather than just a stated opinion. But that's okay. Uh, so let me know what you think. I I you know I. I, I'm guessing that probably not a lot of people have read this book. It was just published. I just got it. And, um, but so maybe on further on down the line, as people get used to it and people will um, come to know the book, maybe you will leave comments. So, um, thank you so much for being here again. Appreciate y'all. So let's dive into it again. This is uh, Cormac McCarthy's the passenger. And it, when I said that it was part of a uh, diptych, what I mean is that there, this book is being published with a, kind of a companion novel which will be which will come out in I think December um, called Stella Maris and this book centers on a character named Bobby Western now uh, the name is you know I, I don't even know if cliche is the word because it doesn't really it's more complex than that obviously the themes in the book are about post the about the uh, about postmodernity and the West especially literally the postmodern period because it centers on sort of life beginning in that era with the um, A-bomb. And of course, Bobby Western is a, is a pretty, he's a complex and interesting dude, uh, not similar to many of the other characters in Cormac McCarthy works. And what I mean is that um, we, we have a guy who he's a, we know he's a wreckage diver. He's a deep sea Deep sea, he can be a deep sea welder slash wreckage diver, and he's with this friend, a guy named Euler, and these these two dudes like decide to go out into the Gulf. It's uh, it it begins at uh, Pass Christian in uh, on the Gulf Coast, right outside of Gulfport. I'm wearing my Gulf my Gulfport Aquarium <laughs> shirt. Shouts out to Gulfport. Shouts out to all my my friends and family, and um and so. It begins just off the coast uh, in the Gulf, and these two dudes go out, and they are diving down to a uh, plane wreckage that, that doesn't seem to have been discovered yet. Uh, one of the guys says, you know, he knows where it is, and they find a, um, a plane uh, at the seafloor, and they dive into it, and they discover some things, which we'll get into in a second. But an overview of the plot is basically that Bobby Western is a uh, wreckage diver, former race car driver. He drives a Maserati. Um, the book is a southern saga because it covers a sort of a multi-generational family, which is, in Cormac McCarthy's style, totally messed up. There's a lot going on. And I, my interpretation, by the way, of some of the, the, the interpersonal events in the book is slightly different some, than some of the reviewers have. Um, and he has a sister... And the sister's name is um, Alicia, and she's dead. She's not alive in the novel. But what we read, we have interspersed throughout the narrative these passages of uh, her her vision in a kind of a at times it's in a it's kind of a psych psychiatric ward. All of her passages are in, are italicized, and really what I come to think of it as as a is a kind of MK Ultra vision of what she has undergone. We find out that Alicia um, haunts Bobby. Uh, specific, I mean, really explicitly haunts him, but, but actually she's haunted by this sort of vaudeville cavalcade of impish figures who are s symbols of her broken psyche. And they are led by um, a kind of a carnival barker, uh, Na impresario named the kid he's actually called the thalidomide kid and of course you you remember from blood meridian that you know the the main character one of the main characters in blood meridian is that named the kid of course there's judge holden and then there's the kid and so you may you know you may interpret the book as a kind of intertextuality where you have this character who from another work who's haunting this work he's in 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 a way he's kind of a passenger get it he's also a passenger in or a dark passenger in the mind of alicia 
And um, he has, it's pretty disturbing. I mean, he has flippers for hands. Um, and there's all, there are a whole bunch of characters, um, which, which we'll, we'll, of course, try to cover. And, um, and, of course, then Alicia is the kind of dark passenger in the mind of Bobby, um, her brother. Now, Alicia is a prodigy. She's a mathematical genius. She, um, it says at one point that she attended University of Chicago uh, at age 13. She's so far above she's so far above the other characters in the book. She can't really hold a conversation with other people because um, she's she, even mathematics itself sort of disappoints her. And um, later when asked why she uh, decided to off herself, um, Bobby says uh, she didn't like it here anymore. And the, the book actually begins with a vision of her lying, um, her dead body in the snow being discovered with the sort of glass eye, you know, the crystalline eyes and the sort of floating hair. The sort of Sylvia Plath-esque, you know, Lady Lazarus, uh, Gorgon floating hair, but it's in the snow. It's frozen in time. Get the symbolism. And she's sort of frozen in time for Bobby. Now, Bobby and Alicia, the reviewers say that they have an um, I in, let's say, in, let's say, I in zestuous relationship. Let's say that. Um, now, there seem Bobby denies this, and we don't know, you know, with the unreliable narrator, we don't know, um, or the unreliable characters, rather, because it's in the third person. We don't know the the truth of what happened, but I my interpretation uh, begins uh, began at some point in the book to I, I began to interpret the incestuous relationship as something, yeah, they were zesty, that it was actually her dad. Um, and that's the reason why it says at one point that her mind was fractured at about the age at about age eight. Now that's interesting because her uh, zesty uh, creep creep creeper dad is a um, he is a phys he's a physicist and he's part of the Manhattan Project. He also is a genius, but he sort of starts to um, at some point he starts to rely on Alicia for her visions and what she can tell him from beyond. Because, of course, with postmodernity um, and post the postmodern novel, of course, uh, you know we have the search for meaning in a broken landscape, and a lot of the philosophy in the book is uh, kind of cringe, I'll say. Um, but it's it's the conversations amongst the characters with points of beautiful, a kind of beautiful terror um, that that really is the height of McCarthy-esque prose. And aside from what they're saying and the, and the conclusions they come to. Um, and anyway, so just, I'm trying to give a basic <laughs> overview of the plot. Um, what happens with Bobby is he and Euler come up or they, sorry, they submerge, they go down, they look in the plane, and they find that um, that one of the passengers is missing. They they can tell that everyone, it's a, this is basically a, it's a private jet, and um, everyone on the in the jet is still in there. All the bodies are intact. They have to unseal the door. They have to cut through the door, get into the plane, into the jet, and they find that um, everyone's in European clothes and shoes, uh, everything's intact except for there's a passenger missing and they're missing the black box and the passenger manifest. Now, they come up and basically they say, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't like it. This is not good and um, we got to get out of here because somebody's already been here and somebody's probably seeing that we've been here and then somebody else is going to come and they're going to find out we've been here. And so then Bobby is is later visited by some uh, sketch, sketchy characters who claim to be one thing but are probably another. And then he finds out that um, people are looking for him and then he has to go on the run. Now, this is not like a, you know, this is not a uh, John Grisham novel. Um, it, there's a lot more to it than that. That's sort of the basic uh, driving narrative, I suppose, except for the fact that when um, what makes it really interesting, one of the things that m makes it really interesting is that Bobby goes on in the run. When he goes on the run, he kind of runs through the um, the deep south sort of tract. So he goes, he's 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 out past uh, past Christiane. Then he drives um, to his home in uh, New Orleans. He lives in the quarter. He lives in the quarter down there 
Oh, they got that bon ton roulé down there in the quarter. Say, hey, Bobby, what you been uh, sea, deep sea diving down there? <laughs> Sounds terrible. Um, but he lives in the quarter in a in a kind of, I would say a kind of streetcar named Desire esque, you know, seedy part of the quarter. But if you've ever been to the quarter, I've only been to the quarter, to the quarter once. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still like that. Down there in New Orleans, it's still like that. I mean, look. You guys been in New Orleans? I mean, New Orleans is is it it's almost like not a part of America. It's like a separate country, and that be- is because of its heritage and where it's from, and the Creole and the Cajun, right? You know, and the Spanish influence and the French influence and the port and you know all this stuff, and you know the architecture and things being wiped away by hurricanes, and then they're rebuilt and everything's sort of damp and you know decrepit and decadent. It's the perfect place for a vampire. <laughs> See our Dracula stream, by the way. Um, And that's why, of course, why Anne Rice said it there. But, you know, when you go there, it's interesting when you go there, if you happen to stay in the quarter, stay at the Ritz. And if you you stay at the Ritz and then you get up and then you walk down, um, down there to the quarter, you'll see, you know, at... Six, seven in the morning, there's this stank. There's this gnawling stank, right? You know, that, that below sea level alcoholic stank down there, you know, drinking those those Tom Collins. And you see these people, you know, lying out there on the on the sidewalk. And it's not, it's not you know, you're not seeing, uh, as Norm MacDonald says, homeless bums. You're, see, you're seeing, you know, regular people just walked out of the Gator Bar and just uh, passed out right there on the street, and you just was stepping right over them. And then, of course, they shampoo the street every day because of that stank, because all the you know all the spilled beer. But uh, Bobby lives down there with the with the seedy characters, and that's interesting because it's this sort of dichotomy between Bobby and where he comes from, and his intellect and his money, and the uh, nefarious characters that he chooses to hang out around. You know, you picture John Candy. Remember John. The best New Orleans character I've ever seen was John Candy in, in the uh, movie JFK. Well, Mr. Garrison, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, he's perfect. That's kind of who he associates with, except it's, um, you know, characters dealing with underground things, drugs, all, all sorts of people. But then he goes, he, he, he leaves his house. His house has been broken into. There's a lot of housebreaking in this. Um, there's a, his house has been broken into, and he finds some missing items. He's got this cat. Takes his cat uh, up uh, to the room over the bar. He says, I'm going to rent this. You know, he doesn't have much. He doesn't care about much. And uh, while he goes out in his Maserati, he's got an old Maserati that he drives around in. And he and he uh, he drives on up there at 140 miles an hour, redlining up to 160. Makes it all the way up there to uh, Knoxville in a few hours, which is pretty crazy. Um, you know, it's five hours from... Uh, Gulfport to North Mississippi, and this guy makes it in a few hours all the way to Knoxville. It's pretty, pretty insane. And uh, of course, he's riding on that old road that I've been on a million times, which is I forty. He gets out to Knoxville, and the reason he goes to Knoxville is because he's from. Um, he's not from there, but his, but he grew up there. His family grew up there. Uh, why, why did they grow up in Tennessee if his dad was a nuclear physicist? Because of Oak Ridge, of course, which our homeboy over there, JD, has talked about a number of times. Makes it on the way over there to eastern Tennessee where the Oak Ridge um, uh, uranium facility was and goes and visits his uh, his old house, finds out that his um, grandmother's house has been broken into and they um, they uh, did the, the they we'll talk about who they is did the uh, typical thing of they stole a bunch of, you know, random items uh, in the house. But they also took the papers. They took his dad's papers. So these were no, you know, these were no uh, average Oak Ridge. Uh, the Oak Ridge, this, this one, the, the Oak Ridge boys, this was more like the uh, Nova boys. This was more like the Northern Virginia boys. Um, and they broke in to steal the papers. Of course, then he digs down in the house and he finds these, um, these, these old lead pipes down there, um, empties them out, and he's got, he's got, uh, Gold double eagle uh, coins down there worth a few million dollars. They've been they were hidden down there by his dad by his Diddy. Diddy, what you hiding that old gold down there for? Now, son, I'm a nuclear physicist. I'm not going to respond to you in that accent. But come on, Diddy, give me some of that gold. I'm going to forget about it till I'm an adult. 
takes it, takes it to the gold shop, you know, kind of spends it, uh, cashes it in as he goes, decides to give, um, let's see, he had given his, uh, this is a, in the past, by the way, um, a flashback, he'd given his um, sister uh, some of the gold, which she spent, I think he gave her half a million, and she spent it on um, a violin, not a Stradivarius, he says, but on a violin. And of course, his sister is so good at math. She is con she is contracted by uh, various uh, expensive. She's contacted by Big Violin. <laughs> Big Violin wants her because she can tune the violins using uh, the mathematical process in her head for the perfect tuning and all this stuff. I don't know when she's a little kid. But anyway, so um, he's still on the run. You know, he goes the. He, the book, you know, consists of tons of dialogue with these various characters. Um, and then he uh, basically goes down, um, finds out that he, you know, it's confirmed he's on the run. And then he ends up on the shore overlooking the sort of burning wreckage of the outer rim of the world, uh, contemplating his future. That's the book. That's like the driving narrative in the book. But there's a lot more to it than that. And... Of course, you know, we've covered the wasteland here, and the wasteland is kind of a proto-postmodern poem. And of, we've talked about how uh, the postmodern, you know, at least the artistic movement, or <laughs> eon, I guess, begins with, the, uh, begins with the detonation at the Trinity test site. And so what we're going to dive into here is some of the passages in the book and some of the language in the book and discuss what it means and discuss what this means in terms of his family and it, they even ask there there's a number of there are a number of things ca uh, covered in the book physics the atomic testing site um jfk and rfk the whole uh, big jfk event um uh generational curses they mentioned general gen generational curses the search for meaning and the mk ultra visions of his sister who is uh, in this facility and has been creeped on by the psychiatrist. And then, of course, what her death means to them. Now, why is it called the passenger? It's called the passenger because um, we never really figure out what happened to the passenger in the jet, but we do know that he is connected through a, a number of different, Bobby's connected through a number, in a number of different ways to the event. But it's called the passenger because of the, the lack, the missing passenger in the plane, and the missing passenger in his own plane, his plane of his, his existence, is his sister. And, of course, her missing um, passenger is her own psyche. She has these sort of DID time breaks and uh, blackouts. And then we discover that the pass that her passengers, which is the cavalcade of, of vaudevillian demons... Uh, visits Bobby. And so, like in the usual Cormac McCarthy style, we, um, we see a lot of the hallucinatory, nightmarish vision of the world with these weird characters. I mean, one of the guys who visits Bobby is a, he's a private investigator and former, um, he's a, what is he, a former magician? Um, he's a former psychic magician uh, soothsayer. And if we were going to really dive into some of the esoteric symbol symbolism in the book, I would say that, of course, uh, like many works of literature, and especially postmodern literature, um, we get the kind of Gnostic fairy tale. Because, of course, Bobby and Alicia are the sort of demiurge Sophia characters um, in this... Uh, hallucinatory kind of post-world apocalyptic vision of Earth. And we get these, uh, these, these demon imps who are guiding them. Almost, they're almost, they almost function as kind of like ascended masters or descended masters in a way. Um, they they um, haunt Alicia, and she, even from a young age, uh, she is contacting these sort of weird spirits and passing on messages to to her father the physicist and of course her father the thing with her father is that he is feels himself responsible for the destruction of the world and for the annihilation that occurs with what he has created and so the the great paradox is 
the kind of creation of this new world, this sort of neo neo Gnostic neo Eden through fission, right? It, it's a it's a creation through destruction, which fit you know is completely fits in line with these sort of apocalyptic uh, archetypes of the Gnostic um, elements we've seen in so many works of literature. Um, so we're going to try to dive into that as best we can. And also, before I get to that, please also remember to help me out by smashing the like and sharing. And if you want to support me, uh, you can uh, drop a fat PayPal or Cash App or Venmo. That gets right to me, and I really appreciate it. I've just been a fortune on books. And uh, so we can keep on. And, of course, you can hit that Super Chat link. You can also hit the, did you know, you can also hit the Super Thanks link. There's a little heart down there. And you can thank me with a, with some kind of a Super Thanks or a big donation if you want to. Speaking of which, uh, we recently got a, um, we're about to do a sponsored stream from our homeboy Presley out there. We're going to do, the next one we're going to do is um, Roger Kipling's The Man Who Would Be King. Of course, Jay has covered The Man Who Would Be King, um, especially the film, and he has uh, written about it extensively. So we're going to do the best we can with that um, and see if there's anything else that we can come up with uh, in terms of an analysis of the novel. Um, I'll also be doing soon, I'll be doing Don DeLeo's Libra. Speaking of the JFK event, this is Don DeLeo's Libra. It's another post. We're not only doing postmodern work here. I mean, we've done a, a wide selection of work. Um, so, but we are um, going into that. We'll be going back into Brett Easton Ellis with the Informers. Um, we'll go. We'll be going back into Shakespeare and covering uh, some of the latter plays with uh, Gnosticism and Neoplatonism in Shakespeare's plays. And I was looking at this last night in the uh, Real Cooter Brown little panel that we had. And thank you to Maddie again for having us on. Really appreciate it. And um, this is uh, Arthur Schnitzler's Dream Story or Trauma Novel. Trauma Novel trauma novel, which is the basis for Eyes Wide Shut. So we may be going back into that. I don't know. But we got a bunch of stuff to cover. All right, so let's begin. You can see just on an initial reading of this book that, you know, as with all McCarthy, the, the, it, we, it takes a lot of deconstruction and explication. So I'm going to try and, as best I can, go back into some of the uh, – some of the passages here. Um, so, let's see. It begins, uh, it begins with italics. We also have a lot of, um, let's see, um, polysyndetic language, okay, which means that McCarthy often will have long passages, especially of dialogue, long long paragraphs and passages, um, which are unified with conjunctions, giving it a sort of a sense of continuity that's almost uh, almost a pre prehistorical or or primordial continuity. Something that shows us like the foundation of of the Western world in language. Something that gives us a kind of a foundation for a mammoth story. Lots of ands and ands and buts. And he says, It had snowed lightly in the night, and her frozen hair was gold and crystalline, and her eyes were frozen cold and hard as stones. One of her yellow boots had fallen off and stood in the snow beneath her. The shape of her coat lay dusted in the snow where she dropped it, and she wore only a white dress, and she hung among the bare gray poles of the winter trees, and her head bowed and her hands turned slightly upward like those of certain ecumenical statues whose attitude asked that their history be considered." that the deep foundation of the world be considered where it has its being in the sorrow of her creatures. The hunter knelt and stogged his rifle upright in the snow beside him and took off his gloves and let them fall and folded his hands one upon the other. He thought that he should pray, but he'd no prayer for such a thing. He bowed his head. Tower of ivory, he said, house of gold. He knelt there for a long time. That part kind of annoys me because what? He has no prayer. He's going to think he's going to pray, pray, but he's not going to pray. Why can't he pray? If you know he's going to pray, if he knows he's going to pray, why don't he just pray? For such a thing. Okay. When he opened his eyes, he saw a small shape half buried in the snow, and he leaned and dusted away the snow and picked up a gold chain that held a steel key, a white gold ring. He slipped them into the pocket of his hunting coat. 
He'd heard the wind in the night, the wind's work, a trash can clattering over the bricks behind his house, the snow blowing out there in the forest in the dark. He looked up into those cold, enameled eyes glinting blue in the weak winter light. She had tied her dress with a red sash so that she'd be found. Some bit of color in the scrupulous desolation. So, from the beginning, we find the dead body of Alicia. This is Bobby's sister. And we um, then we begin chapter one. That's kind of the prologue here. We begin chapter one with um, Alicia or at least a vision of Alicia in the in a psychiatric unit. Here's the description of the thalidomide kid. Oh, shouts out there to Pim. Thank you so much for that $10 super chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. I appreciate you out there. Y'all, if you want to leave a super chat, please don't hesitate to do so. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This then would be Chicago in the winter of the last year of her life. In a week's time, she would return to Stella Maris, and from there, wander away into the bleak Wisconsin woods. The thalidomide kid found her in a rooming house on Clark Street near Northside. He knocked at the door, unusual for him. Of course, she knew who it was. She'd been expecting him. And anyway, it wasn't really a knock, just a sort of slapping sound. Wow. Okay, there's a lot going on in the first paragraph of the book. First of all, she expects the thalidomide kid because he's a character who's known to her. This is not... Um, this is not a human being. This is a, this is a sort of a psychic vision or a vision from her psyche, from her broken mind, and it's also a impresario demon creature who they, they actually later on go on to call him. She actually calls him Beelzebubba, um, which he finds funny because they have this sort of hum humanoid, human-esque conversation. The reason that she hears a slapping sound is because he has flippers for hands. He's a thalidomide kid, right? And, you know, suffice it to say also that she's in Chicago because, as I mentioned in the beginning, she is a student at University of Chicago when she's 13 years old. Now, this is... That, that sounds insane, but we all know that there are these prodigies. Um... And I think my own great granddad went to UVA law school when he was 16. So, so these these people exist. Except, um, oh, I forgot to mention Stella Maris or Stella Maris is the second book that'll be the follow up to this book published in December. I mentioned that earlier, um, and that will be comp it will be her voice. It'll be her life rather than Bobby's. They f they sort of figure as a kind of Gemini twins. Um, and, of course, we can't help but think of unification of opposites and the sort of, uh, the sort of Gnostic mysticism that occurs within the postmodern text a number of times throughout the gamut of the canon of literature. And not just in postmodernism, but in Shakespeare, you know, going back. But we do have this sort of unification in the sense that at the end of the book, we have her demons visiting him, right? And as Maddie says, she up there in Rockefeller in, in D Rock Town, in J Rock Town. Yes, she that's the yes, exactly. Because um she's at a uh, you know, at a at a Rockefeller inst Rockefeller funded institute studying mathematics. Her dad is this physicist. Her brother is also brilliant, by the way. Bobby's also brilliant. He's a uh I mean, this guy's a Chad in a number of ways, right? He's a race car driver treasure hunter, deep sea diver. He's, they ask him if he has a death wish, and he says, no, I don't have a wish. He just knows kind of what he's doing, living sort of, you know, in the outer dark, living in the, on the edges, on the fringes, as, mo as the McCarthyite figures often do. But this book is different because I was really struck by the structure of the book and the, the kind of language in the dialogue because it is much more, nor even though it's abnormal, and it's kind of hallucinatory and surrealistic. It is way different from the narrative structure of the other McCarthy books that we've delved into, especially Blood Meridian. It's, it, it's kind of, there is an obvious intertextuality with Blood Meridian and a kind of recurrence of characters, hence the passenger. But, and we can see that McCarthy himself is heading towards a coda, Right, he'll be 90 years old. He's going to publish Stella Maris. And Stella Maris, or Stella Maris, is the star of the sea, right? And we see this kind of glimmering, um, faint star, uh, you know, dying in the West, just as it's mirrored, you know, in his work, just as it's mirrored in their own postmodern worldview and in the 
kind of bright, exploding star of the atomic bomb uh, itself, if that makes sense. Um, it says, he paced, he paced up and back, and at the foot of her bed, he stopped to speak and thought better of it and paced again, kneading his hands before him like the villain in a silent film. Except, of course, they weren't really hands, just flippers, sort of like a seal has, in the left of which he now cradled his chin as he paused and stood to study her. Back by popular demand, he said, in the flesh, if you took long enough to get here, yeah, the lights were against us all the way. How did you know which room it was? Easy, room 4C, I foresaw it. What are you using for money? I still got money. The kid looked around. I like what you've done with the place. Maybe we can get we can tour the garden after tea. What are your plans? Tour the garden after tea is a reference to. It seems to be a reference to, um, to you remember in the wasteland in the first in the game of chess in the wasteland, um, and also in there will be time for tea um, in um, in um, the, in uh, what is it? Fuck. Um, the other T.S. Eliot, um, a love song of jail for proof rock. Oh, nice. Nico sends a, a fat super chat. I'll get to that in a second there, Nico. Thank you. Appreciate you. Um, but we see right away the fragmented wasteland landscape. And of course, one thing McCarthy does that's interesting is in terms of his stylistic choices, which I appreciate, is that he um, will often, he will often. Completely, you know, he has the ultimate kind of, um, you know, uh, poetic license with his work, right? He 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 just eliminates. A lot of times he will eliminate punctuation, but he really eliminates apostrophes, which I appreciate because he says that they're unnecessary. Basically, he's saying that or showing that they are unnecessary in the fluidity of the lines. Even though we're not reading lines of verse, we're reading you know prose paragraphs. But in terms of the lines of dialogue, especially, or in the inner monologue of the characters, uh, also we, we we he eliminates um, quotation marks, which are also unnecessary. We know because we have it scripted. Uh, it's almost like a screenplay how the characters speak, and we know that one is speaking, then the next speaking because of the next line, but. The quotation marks simply serve as a, almost as a visual stumbling block to the, the fluid nature of the characters and their dialogue with one another, so he eliminates it. Because it's also, it also kind of goes to show it's a visual marker of the fact that a lot of the conversations that take place in McCarthy are not actual conversations. They're almost soul conversations or psychic conversations or conversations with oneself or one's own psyche. And by, by marking the text with quotation marks, you're showing that this is a real conversation that's taking place in the world right now. But with McCarthy and his text... It, it's almost like there's an ambiguity where we don't know whether this thing is... It's so weird, we don't know whether it's actually occurring or not. Yo, shouts out to Kate who says, now one of my favorite channels. Really enjoyed No Country for Old Men, Gatsby, and White Noise. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. That means a lot. Thank you so much. Yes, um, Goose says, conversations about conversation. There is a lot of conversation in this book, more so than usual. Um, and I think that, I, you know, the, the next book, the follow-up, hasn't been published yet, but it's, I, I'm guessing that it will be a lot more in the vein of the old McCarthy in terms of the absolute weirdness of the conversations and the hugeness, the size of what they are discussing, which is, you know, meaning itself, especially meaning in light of what they themselves have done, what they themselves have created on Earth or created or destroyed, especially in terms of their physicist father. Um, Maddie says, drops 10 bucks and says, this plot reminds me of how Cormac said he most prefers to hang out with scientists. It really makes me wonder what he picked up from them. I think that's a good point, Maddie. Yeah, um, I think that uh, he's picked up a lot. Uh, Cormac McCarthy is a board member at the Santa Fe Institute, and I think he wrote, he, he wrote, he rewrote their mission statement, which is, a lot of people think that Cormac McCarthy has no sense of humor. Um, but even that statement, even though that's not a published work, it's from his own life, um, is shows the kind of dark or ironical humor that, that McCarthy is prone to. I mean, I think that there has to be humor. The book is not, it's not laugh out loud funny, but it's humorous in the sense that there's a lot of prediction in the book, or at least back prediction. At one point, he predicts the fact that, um, 
you know, he predicts sort of the Internet of Things and enumeration uh, as an offshoot of physics and communication in the book, which is pretty funny in light of the context of, of what, he's, what he's saying here, which is that, you know, the main character is being hunted, right? That we, there's, there's, there will be so much identity that the only identity will be no identity because you will have to completely lose your identity in the public sense of any communications in order to not be tracked, which is what he says in the text. Um, here's the, uh, this is the second chapter in the third, uh, in the first, sorry, the first section of the book. And this is where we get Bobby Western, who's a, as I said, sort of a real, you know, real, uh, kind of a Sigma character, kind of a Sigma Chad says he sat wrapped in one of the gray rescue blankets from the emergency bag and drank hot tea. The dark sea lapped around the coast guard boat that had pulled up a hundred yards off sat rocking in the swells with the running lights on and beyond that 10 miles to the north you could see the lights of trucks moving along the causeway coming out of nolens and heading east along us 90 toward past christian biloxi mobile mozart's second violin concerto was playing on the tape deck the air temperature was 44 degrees and it was 317 in the morning i love the details of mccarthy but one thing that i get from this is also the sense of location the, the locus you know because because uh, this really makes me excited, on a personal note, to uh, go back down and see my family at Christmas down there uh, in Gulfport. Because I can't wait to go back to Past Christiane and go to, go to some of these locations. Maybe we'll even head into New Orleans, which is not far from, from Gulfport. Uh, maybe while we're there, we'll go, <laughs> maybe while we're there, we'll go visit uh, the old Nick Cage Pyramid Tomb. Down there, down there in the uh, Baltimore quarter. Down there, we're gonna go visit uh Nick Cage's uh. We got I'm, like, shouts out to y'all cracking the GMO drink. Gonna go down to visit old Nick Cage's uh pyramid tomb down there, right? And I just I love, I love the fact. Here's one thing about Southern writers, being a Southerner myself. Um, I love it when. Southern writers um, focus on the South <laughs> for what it really is or what it really can be or to anyone who lives here um, or lives down, down, down there, which is no mention of the cliched stuff that is always mentioned when you're um, discussing the South, right? We're talking about... We're talking about we're talking about some real people who do real things and have the um, Oak Ridge uh, uranium facility in Tennessee, and we have Cormac McCarthy, of course Cormac McCarthy, born in Rhode Island, but a transplanted Southern and a Southern writer. He's a Southern writer, and this is a kind of uh, there's a kind of I don't know if authentic is the word, but a kind of authentic um, you know beauty to this part of the country. You rarely get. You rarely get works of literature focused in the South that don't have that mention of the other things, if you know what I mean. And, you know, we're talking about real people who live their lives, and that's not a, a looming psychic problem, right? These are people who do the normal things that people do everywhere else, and if not that, who sort of supersede all that in their... Um, in their focus and their in, and their intent and their wish for, you know, their search for uh, meaning, and and I just I just love that I love that you know th that we don't have a we also don't have a southern gothic right we have a kind of just a a, a sort of a I don't know a simulacrum for the broken world of the of post modernity. In their view, that's not my view, but in their in the view of of these works of literature, that has transcended this kind of you know uh, southern gothic, this sort of southern gothic uh, trope or fairy tale that has take that that took over southern writing and southern literature for so long. We don't have that, and um, I love the places. I love where he goes in this, and um, yeah, let me read Nico's super chat here uh, before I get too far up the chat. Um, let's see. Nico says, Nico says, 
I have two favors to ask. Drops a $50 fat chat. Thank you so much, Nico, for that $50 fat chat. Appreciate you. Will you please do a review of two movies, he says. Angel Heart, released on 3687. Strange Days. Strange Days. Sorry. Have Found Us, uh, released 10 13 Yes, Strange Days with Ray Fiennes. I'm extremely curious of your view. Thank you for all you do. Much respect, and please continue. Well, thank you, Nico. I really appreciate you, homeboy. Thank you so much for that that support. And, um, yeah, I, I will do those. I mean, I, I, um, typically, you know, we don't, we don't do movie analyses here unless it's, uh, based in literature cause we're the, the, the lit analyzer. And of course, cause our betters are, are experts at films, right? Especially JD. Um, but since you drop a $50 fat chat there, yeah, I'll definitely look into Angel Heart. We covered Angel Heart, um, as part of, our stream on Dr. Faustus and the Faustian bargain way back at the beginning, not way back, it was only eight months ago, but it, way back in terms of the life of this channel. And uh, I would love to do Strange Days, um, and I'll do that, especially just because of the Doors reference. Um, and it's a dystopian uh, tale of Ray Fiennes being cool, long-haired Ray Fiennes being cool. So, so, yeah, I will definitely do this for you. Yeah, that looks good, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And Angel Heart, of course, down there in the quarter. We discussed um, uh, Mickey Rourke just the other day. Synchro, bro. We discussed Mickey Rourke, who's great in that film. And um, Mickey Rourke, of, of course, we discussed in the Caddyshack stream because, remember, he was supposed to play Noonan. How awesome, though, would it be if Mickey Rourke was in Caddyshack? That's a totally different film. And... Uh, Wow, you know, just even, I don't know. That's pretty cool to even think about. But yeah, so we'll definitely do those um, for sure. And Nico Drops 499 says, please do them. Yes, I will definitely for you. Um, so we'll get to that. Um, let's see. On page 19 here of the book I wrote, the concrete details about the plane, the passengers strapped in their seats with floating hair, Lady Lazarus with, Lazarus with arms like marionettes. Let's read this little passage real quick. It says, Euler, who is, Euler is um, Bobby Western's BFF. He's his homeboy. And of course, spoiler alert, of course, uh, Euler dies. And what actually happens is um, everyone in, in Bobby Western's life dies. <laughs> Everyone in everyone's life dies, but but in Bobby Western's life, everybody that he cares about, these sort of sideline characters and the people that he cares about, they go. Even the cat goes missing because the people who come to visit him uh, open up the door to his apartment where he's trying to hide, and they let the cat out, and he, he goes out searching for the cat. He can't ever find it. I think, the, what's the cat's name? Davy Jones. Um, and that it might be Davy Jones. Cat's got a cool name. But Euler, um, at one point, Euler tries to get Bobby to uh, pick up the contract to go and do some deep sea um, welding on a on an oil pipeline in Venezuela, and he can't get to he. I don't know if he can't get there at that point because they've pulled his passport. Um, but he decides not to go. He's not going to go on this expedition. He's got a bad feeling about it. And later we find out that Euler, of course, did die. And, of course, what we know, what we would say through ellipsis is that, is that um, Euler has probably taken the contract and been eliminated. He's been liquidated, literally. He's been liquidated in his uh, undersea mission by the people who are concerned about the loose ends when he discovers the jet. And they probably mean to get Bobby Western down there, um, but he decides not to go, and then they try to get him in other ways. So here's some details, though, from this page. It says, Euler had cut away the, the latching mechanism and the door stood open. He was just inside the plane, crouched against the bulkhead. He gestured with his head, and Western pulled up in the door, and Euler shone his light down the aircraft aisle. The people sitting in their seats, their hair floating. That's the lazy, lazy sorry, Lady Lazarus image, right? Um of um, Sylvia Plath and the kind of Gorgon image of the uh, drowned man. Remember in T.S. Eliot, remember T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, right? The drowned man. Uh, their mouths opened, their eyes devoid of speculation. 
the work basket was sitting on the floor inside the door, and Western reached and got the other dive light and pulled himself into the plane. He kicked his way slowly down the aisle above the seats, his tanks dragging overhead. The faces of the dead inches away. <clears throat> Everything that could float was against the ceiling. Pencils, cushions, styrofoam, coffee cups. Sheets of paper with the ink draining off into hieroglyphic smears. A tightening claustrophobia. He doubled under and got himself turned around and made his way back. One interesting image here is that is that um, the the inversion that occurs because we have a plane underwater, right? Where it the plane floats in the air, but it floats underwater. It's lodged against the seafloor. It's instead of you know this is the thing like I saw I saw a commercial today for. Uh, Coming for Christmas. Uh, buy or stream now one of the greatest movies ever made, Top Coom 2, Maverick. And I remember when I was six years old watching Top Gun, and, uh, and, I, and I learned that, um, you know, pilots often have that problem of, like, you can't tell which way is up, you know, because the, 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 the uh, sky and the sea reflect one another, and up is down and down is up. But here we get that literally with the submarine plane, right? And the plane is also the a pun here, kind of an intellectual pun for a different sort of plane of existence. And the fact that all of the writing is smudged into these kind of hieroglyphs, and we're almost reading a kind of a hieroglyphic text for the futures of these characters and what will happen, right? Um, and... Hold on a sec. Let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this one. Uh, there we go. Done. Okay. And it says, um, let's see, the tightening claustrophobia. What else was I going to say there? Um, oh, and also the great uh, show versus tell elements of the text, right? Um, we don't get the telling of the story. We get the showing of the concrete details, right? I'm on a plane. I can't complain, Jeff says. The co-pilot was still strapped into his seat, but the pilot was hovering overhead against the ceiling with his arms and legs hanging down like an enormous marionette. Right? So these are uh, puppet characters um, who are... They're almost... They're puppet characters, and what we sense when we're reading into this is that they are puppets of whatever the corporation, loosely speaking, an actual corporation or the corporation terms of a criminal syndicate have sent them there, right? And that Bobby is going to find himself a kind of a marionette figure, and then also Alicia is demonically possessed of these visions of these marionette vaudeville characters, right? Um, it says, Western's shown his light over the instruments, the twin throttle levers in the console were per pulled all the way into the off position. The gauges were analog, and when the circuits shorted out in the seawater, they'd returned to neutral settings. There was a square space in the panel where one of the avionics boards had been removed. It had been held in place by six screws by the holes there, and there were three jack plugs hanging down where the pigtails had been disconnected. Western wedged his knees against the backs of the seats at either side. Good stainless steel Hoyer watch on the... On the uh, um, on the co-pilot's wrist, Hauer. Is it Hauer? Tag Hauer? He studied the panels. What's missing? Colesman altimeters and vertical speed indicators, fuel in pounds, airspeed at zero, Collins avionics. Otherwise, it was the navigation rack. He backed out of the cockpit. The bubbles from the regulator sorted themselves along the dome of the roof overhead. He looked in every possible space for the pilot's flight bag, and he was pretty sure it wasn't there. He pushed out through the door and looked for Euler. He was hovering over the wing. He made a circling motion with one hand and pointed upward and kicked off toward the surface. He was hovering over the wing. I I amazing, amazing details. They sat on the small deck of the inflatable and pulled off their masks and spat out the regulator mouthpieces and leaned back into the tanks and loosened them. Credence Clearwater. They got the Credence tapes, y'all. What'd you have here? Oh, some papers, just some papers. Uh -huh. I wouldn't hold out much, much hope. Or the Credence. Right. <laughs> 
was playing on the tape deck. Western got his thermos out. What time is it, said Oiler? 4.12. He spat and wiped his nose with the back of the wrist. He leaned past Western and twisted the valves of the gas bottles. I hate shit like this, he said. What, bodies? Well, that too, but no, shit that makes no sense, that you can't make sense out of. Yeah. There won't be anybody out there for a couple of hours or three. What do you want to do? What do I want to do or what do I think we should do? I don't know. What do you make of this? I don't. That's typical Bobby Western um, dialogue in the sense that he never says, this guy's a genius. He's not as a genius like his sister was, but he's, uh, yeah, we got leads. <laughs> we could put our best man on it. <laughs> we got it working in shifts. <laughs> um, <laughs> But Bobby always responds in the most terse manner because he only sort of he, he really only says what he has to say, which is why he's so good when he's in, when he is uh, met by the so-called investigators who show him a badge and he makes he jokes with them. Yeah, let me see your badge number again. No, let me see it again. And um, of course, he's a genius and remembers the badge number the first time he sees it. And they say, "You're pretty good with numbers, aren't you?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'm okay." Um, Let's see. Uh, he never says more than he has to, right? What do I want to do with the bodies, or what do I want to do here? Or what do I think we should do? All right, on page, let's see, page twenty, page twenty-eight. This is a true McCarthy passage. Not a bit of it. He is sinking into a darkness he cannot even comprehend. Darkness and immobilizing cold. I enjoy talking about him if he does not. I'm sure you'd like to hear the sin and atonement part, that at the very least. He's an attractive man. Women want to save him, but of course he's beyond all that. What say you, Squire? How far off the mark? Rave on, Shedden. I think I'll rest my case. I know what you're thinking. You see in me a vast ego, unstructured and baseless. But in all candor, I've not even the remotest, remotest aspirations to the heights of self-regard which the squire commands, and I'm not unaware that it even lends a certain validity to his views. After all, I'm merely an enemy of society. Um, I wrote, he hopes to dive into the deep to atone for his sins. That's why he's a deep-sea diver. That's why he's a wreckage diver. Get it? Do you get it? Do you get what McCarthy's doing here? He's having Bobby with this death wish as a... You know, he, he goes fast and he dives into wreckage because it's a it's a symbol of his diving into the wreckage of his own past and of his life and of his future because the also his inner wreckage is, again, kind of a simulacra for the outer wreckage of the world for which he finds himself in a kind of generational generationally cursed part because of his dad's actions. At least that's how he sees himself, if that makes sense. I feel like I ought to read a lot of this in the uh, posh voice, right? In in the posh redneck voice. Um, let's see. It says, like when they're describing uh, this guy, it says, um, I'm afraid there is. It's near Oak Ridge. His father's trade was the design and fabrication of enormous bombs for the purpose of incinerating whole cities full of innocent people as they slept on their beds. Cleverly conceived and handcrafted things, one off each of them, like vintage Bentleys. Weston himself I met at the university, well, actually the first time I ever saw him at the Club 52 out on the Asheville Highway. Asheville Highway! Shouts out to some of our homeboys out there at, in Asheville. He was up on the stage playing the mandolin with the band Bluegrass. I've never met him, but I know who he was. He was a mathematics major with a four-point grade average. Somebody at our table invited him over, and we got to talking. I quoted Surin to him, and he quoted Plato back on the same subject. And he had his beautiful sister. I think she was 14, and he would take her to these clubs. They were just... It says, oh, this is, not, this is nasty, you guys. It says they were just openly dating, and she was even smarter than he was and just dropped dead gorgeous. A flat-out train wrecker. He got a scholarship at Caltech, and he went there and studied physics, but he never got his doctorate. He came into some money and went to Europe to race cars. That's about Bobby Western. Now, did you get what he said there? Everyone in the book speculates that Bobby and Alicia, who are brother-sister, are actually in a, what can we call this, a creeper, a creeper sick relationship but we don't know that that's true 
because my my interpretation of this is actually that they are bonded by something that they have both undergone, not necessarily that they are. And maybe I'm missing a big part of this. I need to revisit it. But everyone, I think that's part of the ambiguity of the book, that everybody in the book and the, all of the characters say that these two are dating, okay? But every time they uh, ask Bobby about it, he's like, no. Um, and, of course, he would say that, or any person... Well, he wouldn't be a person if he was involved in this in the first place. Um, he'd be a something else. But, but I think that it's it seems to be more likely because of her break at eight at age eight that um, this is something that their physicist dad has done, and that that's what he has he has bonded them in their sort of trauma together. You remember that we talked about this recently. Remember the the uh, the the Duke twins, the. Um, the remember they were on Dr. Phil. Listen, I understand that you two are the richest people in the world, okay? But here's my question: What if you weren't, okay? Right. Um, and so they were both, you know, held in C A G E S and all this, all this terrible stuff. And so I think that that is probably actually what's going on, I, but I, I'm not sure. Um, um, uh, let's see. This says, there's a description here. Um, it says, oh, the man's a uh, seducer of prelates and a suborner of the judiciary. This is like a John Candy, Candy Nolan's character talking about him. He's an habitual male candler and a practicing gelignitionary, a mathematical platonist, and a something I can't say here of domestic yard fowl, principally of the Dominecker persuasion, a... Chicken, F-U-C-K-E-R, not to put too fine a point on it. So, in other words, he's using colorful language in a kind of a um, lyrical, Cajun-esque style in a bar to describe this other character. Basically saying this guy's a shit, right? Um, on page 40, we get Nam. So, what we get here is... Uh, Bobby meets up with this Nam character, and the guy says, uh, "We get we get a description of what Nam was like." He says, um, "You get a taste for it. People don't want to hear that. Too bad. I thought our outfit was pretty much a bunch of somethings, and then we got a new CO, Wingate, Lieutenant Colonel, and he started kicking." ass and taking names. Day one, everybody knew the war was shit. By late 68, the whole thing was sliding off into the toilet. Drugs used to be just at the rear, but by then they were pretty much everywhere. Guys shooting civilians. You got a new platoon leader, and the first thing you had to decide was whether or not you were going to have to frag his fucking ass to save your own. The real problem was you couldn't get to the field grades. They were hanging medals on each other for engagements they couldn't find on a field map. I got back to headquarters, and it took them a few days to get me reassigned, which was fucked up. They never... They never got it that you wanted to that you wanted to be with your buddies. You didn't want to be moved around. Just dumb as shit. I made E6 by then, so they couldn't have me mopping floors. But the colonel used to have me run errands for him. Then one day I heard him on the phone, and I found out later he was talking to a bird colonel up in operations, and he told this guy he didn't give a fuck. He said, let me kill you something, colonel. I'm here to kill people, and if I don't get to kill people, I'm going to be a hard motherfucker to live with. And if you're not here to kill people, you, don't, you need to let me know because I don't want to work for you. This is a quote from the book. And then he hung up the he hung the phone up, and I knew that he was my kind of guy. He was a warmonger and motherfucker, and I was there to inflict painful death myself, and that's the only reason I was there. And you won't like this either. Um, did I do that? I've been asked that question a few times, but never before by a man. I told this one girl I was seeing that yes, I'd killed a bunch of uh, slang term for um, uh, Charlie, but that I hadn't eaten any of them. So what do you think? You had enough of this shit? Go ahead. And then he goes on to talk about Nam, and uh, on page 40, let's see. On page 40, we get a, oh, yeah, this is hardcore. Okay, we get a PSYOPs, a PSYOPs ship. It says, anyway, mostly I just slept my ass off. There was a PSYOPs sound ship would show up about 3 o'clock in the morning just oaring away out there in the dark, broadcasting the sound of a baby crying over and over. They knew that we weren't going to send anybody up about that. If you shot it down, it would probably just fall on you. After a while, I got to where I kind of liked it. I just kind of drift off back to sleep. Um, 
And then he says, he talks about LERPs. Remember the LERPs? Um, this is page 41. Yeah, that's true. In this case, we got called into an LZ where a Huey had been shot down going in. There were four guys in there that they were supposed to bring out LERPs, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Um, you wouldn't think they'd have got themselves into such a fucking mess. Two of them had stepped on punji sticks. We didn't make out much better than the Huey. Well, as it turned out, we did make out a bit better because the Huey pulled up and wobbled off into the jungle and crashed and caught fire. We never saw any of those guys again. We found out later there was a slick coming in behind us, but when they saw us, all this mess just pulled up. Smart guys. We'd had to dump a bunch of fuel for the weight in order to load our guys, and I kept thinking, what if something hot comes in here? Anyway, the tail hits the tops of the trees first, and we nose down. Rotor's whacking the shit out of everything. The other door gunner was a guy we called Wasatch, and I jumped out, and he kept on... He just kept on firing, and the ship was tipped sideways, and one of these hot shell casings went down the back of my flight suit, and it hurt like a motherfucker. What followed us was four days in the jungle and a bunch of running firefights, and I came out of there with only one guy left, and he died in the chopper going out. You get a fucking medal for that? Give me a break. That's it, Bobby. I'm done. So this guy's talking to Bobby Western. Bobby Western, see, part of the, part of this, why is he doing this? Why is he, excuse me, folks, why is he... <laughs> Why is he doing all this dialogue? Because this represents the kind of um, fractured voices from the past that you hear in the the kind of nuclear wind of the postmodern landscape of literature. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's a reason why all of these interspersed languages occur in the fragmentation of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland there's a reason why McCarthy often has a wide variety and cast of weird characters who make an impression on the protagonist. And here we get a guy searching for meaning by going into the, again, going into the wreckage of his past. And one of these guys is a former, um, a former door gunner in Nam who's talking about, you know, getting a medal. He got a, he got a medal for saving a guy. Everybody, all these LERPs were killed. When we think of LERPs, we think of Phoenix program, right? Phoenix um, Doug Valentine's Phoenix program. Remember um, the guy in, in True Detective 3, Mahershala Ali, plays a former LERP. We get these guys, these ears for beers guys, who go out and you know search and destroy missions or long-range reconnaissance patrol, and they wouldn't get themselves into this trouble. They're way past the wire. They're right on the fucking edge, man. They're right on the edge. Right? And they go out past the wire into this territory, and he wouldn't expect them to get in trouble like this, but they did, and they had to send a Huey in with a door gunner. And then everybody gets wiped out, and he saves a guy, but then the guy ends up dying anyway, and then they give him a medal, and he can't understand that, right? He can't understand why he deserves or gets this medal. What's that even mean? It's meaningless to him. But what does that mean for Bobby and for this, this book? Is What it means is that just like the guy is a door gunner on a ship, and he saves his passenger, and the passenger plays a kind of psychic dark passenger in his own life, well... This guy talking to Bobby is also going to be a passenger in his life. Meaning you take on all of the people and all of the kind of psychic weight of these characters and it synthesizes into his own notions of meaning and existence. And that is really the, that's really the meaning of the novel, right? Is that um, his, he and his sister are both determined to search out and find meaning in a world that is that is destroyed by their dad and then sort of recreated in a sort of a Gnostic Neo-Eden. And he is constantly... I mean, look, even on the first page, we have the hunter who finds the dead sister and he, like... It says that the 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 narrator says that he he should pray, but he doesn't pray because all these people they're so, they're constantly searching for God. They want salvation, but they just it's almost like they're just too uh, blocked up by their own notions of of what they think the world is to have the humility to 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 do that to pray right and. That when the demon when the demon imps come to visit um, his sister, they t they tell her like, no, you think that you know what fear is, but you don't know what fear is, and the universe is a lot more complex, but also a lot more simplistic than you think it is, because she's searching for like mathematical algorithms that will solve the, you know, the the music of the spheres, which is why she plays violin, but she can't she can't just come to terms with the fact that 
she's looking in the wrong places. Um, uh, on page 45C, um, they, the investigators come and visit Bobby and they say, like, do you, they say, do you remember everything? And he says, pretty much. I love, char- I love, it's okay, baby. Dog's down here. Um, I love characters who are um, looking for, uh, who are the kind of conflicted protagonists and yet they are also geniuses. I think it's, it's kind of becoming a trope in literature, but I do appreciate it because it gives us something more to hold on to, right? Yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of Fs in a row, but I was quoting the text. Right? Those weren't mine. So look, I apologize to the affiliates. I won't do it again. Um the the MK Ultra Vision in um section two, she said that the hallucinations had begun when she was twelve at the onset of uh something. Uh, quoting from the literature, watching them write on their pads, the psychiatrist, um, reality didn't really much seem to be their subject, and they would listen to her comments and then move on. That the search for its definition was inexorably buried and subject to the definition it sought. Or, in other words, what that means is, what that means is, oh, oh, they're looking for truth, but they have, they don't realize that there's an objective truth, right? Everything is sort of subjective. Um, or that the world's reality could not be a category among others therein contained. In any case, she never referred to them as hallucinations, and she never met a doctor who had the least notion of the meaning of number. This, then, would be in the little room under the eaves of her grandmother's house in Tennessee in the early winter of 1963. Big JFK event. Here we go. She woke early in the morning and on that cold day to find them assembled at the foot of her bed. She didn't know how long they'd been there, or if the question itself had any meaning. If, if the question itself had any meaning... Because, um, because they've always been there. These are the sort of descended masters, right? Um, it's same thing. It's they're these the sort of ascended master demons, who are who have been broken out in her because of her fractured psyche and her. If she's been um, creeped on, then she has been. Then her brain has retreated to a place where another another persona or another being has taken the place of the first one and so when she she has these blackouts and then she gets in contact with her former self inside of her own body and then it's mixed in with these characters that came in because of the dark passengers that came in to her soul or her mind or her psyche because of what she has undergone in the kind of split right the split, think of the split. I mean, she is, in a way, she herself is kind of a passenger in her dad's life because if he's trying to split an atom, right, he's trying to split an atom or split an atom like an Adam and Eve, like to split them apart or to split a garden of Eden, to make a new Eden in this, he's this kind of demiurge. Or he's trying to split his own blood, his own bloodline, because that's what he's doing through creating this death event, if that makes sense. Um, it says, the kid was sitting at her desk going through her papers and making notes in a small black notebook. When he saw she was awake, he put the notebook away somewhere in his clothes and turned. All right, he said, Let, looks like she's awake. good Oh, He rose and began to pace back and forth with his flippers behind his back. What were you doing going through my papers, and what were you writing in that book? One question at a time, princess. All in due course. Book. Book of hours. Book of yours, okay? You've got a certain amount of ground to cover, so we need to get going. In other words, he's going through the pages of her life book. Right? This is uh, the kid. This is the sort of demon kid. This is the thalidomide kid. And I think that it's interesting that he has the flippers of the, he has flippers and Bobby himself wears flippers because he dives into the wreckage, a a literal wreckage and a figurative wreckage. Uh, The wreckage of the text or the surface level of life and then the subtext or the submarine of the avionics within the airplane, which are the kind of, function as the kind of symbolic outer symbolism of the the um the gauges of his own life 
how he's going to gauge what he's going to do and what he's going to do next. And you can tell that just as Bobby, they're these kind of Gemini twins, right, as I mentioned, and just as Bobby is so good at, he's kind of like, <laughs> he's kind of like Ron Swanson <laughs> in a way. In, um, in what in that show, right? Because like when Ron Swanson is is visited by the the uh, the investigators and the questioners, he always answers a question with a question. Um, do you know you, what you were doing on the night of you know on the on the night of the uh, of the thirty third? Eliminate confirm, and he's like, "Do I know? Yes. Do you know? Do you think that I know?" So. They say, okay, you know what, we're done here. And just as he does that, Alicia is obviously <laughs> far above um, any questions by any kind of psychiatric institute. She knows what they're going to ask. She knows how to answer it. She knows what to answer. And she, her kind of, her struggle seems to be something that is far beyond what they're even capable of getting at, right? Which is probably true, right? You know what they're going to ask. You know how to answer it in such a way that you're not going to, you know, incriminate yourself into, you know, being straight-jacketed or whatever. And you know that, um, you know, she she feels like when they even ask a question about anything involving enumeration, any kind of number, that they just, they're so far below what she what she could even, you know, what she can even posit as an answer. Um, uh, the taxon rose. Let's see. Oh, on page um, 52 and 53, we do get hints of, we get an allusion here to John Berryman, uh, the confessional, so-called confessional poet John Berryman, one of the great lyric poets, great American lyric poets, Pulitzer Prize winner John Berryman and his dream songs. And it's, inter it, it's interesting here because the, her, Alicia's visions or at least our our interpretation of her visions because she's gone. It's it's almost like Bobby's reading a tarot card of her life, right? Because he's looking for a fortune in her own in the in in his interpretation of her visions. And she was doing the same. My dog just moved the light. <laughs> you fixing the light for me? Thank you, baby. Um that's good. You good stage manager here. <laughs> um and she is uh you know, parsing out the visions for her physicist dad. And this is all a kind of a dream song. And the reason I say it's an illusion here is because, um, I mean, uh, shouts out to base homeschool mom. She mentioned uh, Sylvia Plath. We were talking about psychiatric institutes and um, electroshock last night. And she mentioned that, you know, Sylvia Plath was subject to this. And of course, I think all the confessional poets were Sylvia Plath, Marianne Moore, Anne Sexton, John Berryman, Robert Lowell. They were all, they all were, institutionalized or under the care of these uh, demonic psychopaths for a while. And um, it says on this page, um, his top hat and tails dusty from the road. He clicked his cane and smiled and bowed. He clicked his cane. So he's kind of, again, this is a kind of a Beelzebubba, as they say in the book. He is a, um, he is a kind of carnival barker, um, really a provocateur in her psyche. And shouts out to Randy West out there. Appreciate you, Randy. Thank you for that $1 super chat. Appreciate you. And it says, the kid leaned back in his chair and looked about with satisfaction. All right, he said. This is more like it. Mr. Bones called the interlocutor. What do we have on the program for this evening? Mr. Bones is a reference, a specific reference to John Berryman's dream songs. Of course, we also have Mr. Kurtz. He did. Heart of Darkness. And that's the, um, that is the epigraph to the poem, The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices in the wind echo. Remember uh, Marlon Brando in, reading the hollow men in Apocalypse Now? Go back and watch our Apocalypse Now stream or our T.S. Eliot stream. Well, so Mr. Interlo Interlocutor, are we going to do the um, something, I'm not going to say that word, dance for Miss Ann, Miss Ann here. We're fixing to do the dry long so shuffle, and we're going to dance the wearily wheat till the house cats take to the barn, and we got tap dancing on the menu, so don't nobody leave early. They're doing a kind of surrealistic um, show that is too controversial for, for me to mention, but involves people in top hats like the jazz singer, Al Jolson. The, key, the kid leaned back in his chair and put one flipper to the side of his mouth, 
Say that's right, he whispered hoarsely. My name's not Ann. Mr. Bones, you ready to pick that thing? Yes, sir, yes, sir, called Bones. He sprung up again and began to play the banjo. His eyes were blue, and his straw-colored hair showed them from under the brim of his hat. Mr. Bones called the interlocutor. Papa Mole comes along the tunneling under the garden, and he sniffs, and he says, I smell rutabagas. And Mama's Mole come along behind him, and she sniffs. She says, I smell turnips. And Baby Mole comes along and sniffs. And what does Baby Mole smell? He smells. He says he don't smell nothing but molasses. And all these demons fall over. Hooting and guffawing, the entities chortled, and the kid grinned and took out his notebook and wrote it in it and put it away again. Mr. Bones. Um, we get, let's see. Ah, uh, the keloidal skull. Oh, yeah, this part's heavy. Um, let's see. Page 56. It says... I love descriptions like this from McCarthy. Um, on page, page 55, C and D, it says, The kid shook his head wearily. Yeah, well, he said. He dredged up his watch and opened it and checked the time, and he put the watch away again. He yawned and patted his mouth with one flipper. Of course, as I just mentioned, right, the flipper, because Bobby has the flippers on, is the wreckage sea diver. Um, he yawned and, uh, yeah, look, he say, he said, he put me... Let me put it to you this way. As the vicar said to the choir boy, to the seasoned traveler, a destination is at best a rumor. I wrote that. It's in my diary. Good for you. When you carry a child in your arms, it will turn its head to see where it's going. Not sure why. It's going there anyway, the passenger, right? You just need to grab your best hold. That's all. You think there's these rules about who gets to ride the bus and who gets to be here and who gets to be there. How did you get here? Well, she just rode in on her lunar cycle. I see you looking for tracks in the carpet, but if we can be here at all, we can leave tracks or not. The real issue is that every line is a broken line. You retrace your steps and nothing is familiar. So you turn around to come back, only now you've got the same problems going the other way. Every world line is discreet, and the Caesura Ford a void that is bottomless. Every step traverses death. He turned in his chair and clapped his flippers. All right, he called places. Now they're going to do the show, right? And the show is the show of her life. But what does that mean when he says every caesura? He says every world line is discreet. The lines are broken because the the generational lines are broken and fractured because of her dad. Um, they're broken between brother and sister. She's dead. And because the linear, the linear, let's see, the the world line that she that she focuses on in her mathematical studies seems to be broken. She cannot find the infinite. She's looking that's what she's looking for. Is she's looking for infinity. But she cannot find meaning because she wants to justify it mathematically and she can't. She needs to justify it uh, metaphysically. Every it says and the Caesura Ford of the Caesura Ford a void that is bottomless. So in other words, what does that mean? That's a great poetic metaphor that we've discussed so many times here. Right? This is why the line of verse stands for the lifeline. That's why poetry is written in lines. Because you have, if we're thinking about this in, in terms of a, 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 linear, a linear model, right? We have the beginning of the line of verse, which is the beginning of the world or, the, or birth. And then we have the end of the line of verse. And it, it can be end stopped or end jammed. It can be end stopped. So there's a period, period at the end of the line. And that's the end of the line. That's the end of life. Or it drops off onto the next line, which is like this crevasse. You're dropping off into something nameless until you form another life, which is another line of verse. The caesura we discussed, especially when we did the stream on Beowulf and the Anglo-Saxon poets, because Beowulf, of course, is written in Anglo-Saxon verse with a caesura. A caesura is the space in the middle of a line of verse. And it's like a, it's almost like an abyss. He said it's a ford. Right, it's a it's a it's a void that is bottomless, so it's a break in the lifeline, and it's called a caesura, of course, because it's like Caesar, right? It's like Caesar's life being cut short before his life is meant to end, right? But it's also do you get the the weird dichotomy here because it also flips on itself because it's also Caesarian, right? Caesar 
Bur Caesar and Cleopatra birth Caesarian. Caesarian is the son, and we get Caesarian section. So we get the kind of break from one life to form another life. Another life comes out R from his mother's womb untimely ripped, says Macduff. But we also get a life. And, and of course, in Macduff's case, his, his mother dies before he's born, and he's ripped from her womb. But here... We get the break in the lifeline, and that's what they're trying to impart upon, upon Alicia. And I think that this is like what's pushing her towards death, pushing her towards her, her own void, right, which is what she creates for herself, just like her dad creates a void, a void in the, I don't know, people would say like the space-time, you know, they, they always talk about like, you hear things like, you know, when they when they make the atomic bomb, it's like such a rupture in nature that it's like you're forming a, a Neo-Eden, right? Or that it's a rupture in the space-time continuum, right? Um, they, there are interesting passage in this, passages in this about um, Bobby and Alicia's dad and how he's superior to a lot of the other physicists. They talk about Heisenberg, and then they talk about um, Einstein. And at one point they say, like, no, dad said... You know, Einstein is overrated because, like, yeah, he did a lot of good work and important work at the beginning, but then after he did his big thing, um, he didn't do anything else, and he was just kind of lost shuffling his papers at Princeton, which is an interesting take. They also have an interesting take on the big JFK event. So do you want to hear that? Do you want me to skip to that? Because that occurs near the end of the book here. Um, let's see. Right before I get to that, I'll talk about on page... There's so much in this book, you guys. Um, on page... 280, uh, 285, they talk about electronic surveillance, facial recognition, crypto. It says, um, happy days. What else have you got? In the, he's talk, Bobby here is talking to his uh, private investigator slash former um, psychic named Klein. And it says, Klein says, um, uh, he's telling him how he can forge a new identity for him and how he can get away. But then he starts sort of he goes down a tangent of the future, and he says, uh, what else? Difficult to say. Electronic money, sooner rather than later. And the book is set in the early 80s, even though it's written, na you know, it's written now, but it's set in the early 80s. So it's still interesting as a kind of, as a kind of dramatic, dramatic, ironical look into the future from the past. There won't be any actual money, just transactions, and every transaction will be a matter of record forever. You don't think people will object to this, but it's still true now what he's saying. It's still true because people still don't get a, they still don't, even though the future is now, they still can't grasp this or get a hold on it. Uh, you don't think people will object to this? That's a fair question because that's what we see, right? They'll get used to it. The government will explain that it will help to defeat crime, drugs, the sort of large-scale international arbitrage that threatens the stability of currencies. You can make up your own list, but anything that you buy or sell will be a matter of record. Yes. A stick of gum? Yes. What the government hasn't figured out yet is that this scheme will be followed by the advent of private currencies. And shutting these down will mean the rescinding of certain parts of the uh, uh, Constitution. Well, again, I'm sure you know what this conversation sounds like. Of course, let's get back to you. Do you think they've seized your father's papers at Princeton? Probably. You're past all that. I don't know what they're up to, and I never will. And now I don't care. I just want them to leave me alone. They won't. You didn't get along, you and your father. I didn't have a problem with my father, and I didn't have a problem with the bomb. The bomb was always coming. Now it's here. It's lying doggo for the present, but it won't stay that way. My father died alone in Mexico. I have to live with that. I have to live with a lot of things. I, wanna s I went to see him a few months before he died. He wasn't doing well. There was nothing I could do for him, but that didn't excuse doing nothing. How good a physicist was he? He was smart, but smart is not enough. You have to have the balls to dismantle the existing structure. He made some wrong choices. A lot of his friends had Nobel Prizes, but he wasn't going to get one. Is that such a big deal? In physics, it is. How good a mathematician was your sister? We come back to that from time to time. There's no answer to it. Mathematics is not physics. The physical sciences can be weighed against each other and against what we suppose to be the world. Mathematics can, can't be weighed against anything. How smart was she? Who knows? She saw everything differently. She would figure something out, and then half the time she couldn't explain to you how she'd done it. It's too hard for her to understand what it was that you didn't understand. That smart. Get it? Part of her problem is she's so smart that she feels alone amongst other human beings and decides to leave this place, right? She also sees that, in her view, like, 
you know, it's that thing about, in her view, the infinite is essentially, you know, there, there's there's no difference between zero, one, zero and one in view of the infinite mathematically. But her problem is that she can't focus on what infinity means. Um, says, oh, on this page, also on page uh, 287, eight years ago, let's see, it says, yeah, when she, I wrote, when she was eight years old, something happened to her. Um, she saw things different. She's been transformed by her dad. She... She uh, killed herself because she didn't like it here. Which seems to vindicate what I'm saying about the fracture and the rupture that occurs with her and her um, pops. Um, she's also um, GROPD and creeped on by her psychiatrist. Her alter tells her about his teeth because she's... She's... What, is, what did I write? Blanked him from... She's blanked him from her mind and her psyche. Uh, but she doesn't remember biting. Um, and then, um, let's see. We get, on pages 301, we get um, all these characters that Bobby runs into, which is like, which is like, um, you know, he runs into this guy who's like, says, um, listen, man, when you go to the doctor, you can get me one of those half-grain tablets of morphine. You know the blue ones? <laughs> He, this guy wants some blue bombers. He wants some blue Bettys. He's asking him to get him some blue Bettys. Um, let's see. On page 324, um, Western talks to a guy who says that he met Christ. He says, let's see. He says, Sure, I asked her how come she could believe in them, but she couldn't believe in Jesus. What did she say? She said she'd never seen Jesus, but you have, if I remember. Yes. What did he look like? He doesn't look like something. What would he look like? There's not something for him to look like. Then how did you know it was Jesus? Are you jacking with me? Do you really think that you could see Jesus and not know who the hell it was? Did he say anything? No, he didn't say anything. Did you ever see him again? No. But you never lost faith in him? No. That's all you need to know. He heals. Let me quote Thomas Barefoot to you. His truth is not going to come back to him void. It's going to do what he wants it to do. You might want to think about that. Um, Thomas Barefoot, of course, was a convicted murderer waiting to be executed in the state of Texas anyway. Um, then we get, okay, here I'll get to the, uh, the big uh, 1963 event. Shouts out to Genghis out there for that $20 super chat. Appreciate you, homeboy. Thank you so much. Y'all being very generous today. Thank you to all my friends out there. Um, if you're out there and you're watching this, especially if you're watching later and you want to support me, you can go to the uh, channel description or the video description and the links. Click that little down button and the links are right there. You can um, support me anytime. Send a donation, um, Cash App, PayPal, Venmo. Um, you can uh, you can always on the video click a super thanks and you can you can support me. You can sponsor a stream. Send me a uh, hundred uh, Kong bucks, hundred Dugan coin, and <laughs> Dugan coin, and um, and give me some options from which to choose. Uh, we already had our homeboy Nico out there who sent uh, fifty bucks and he wants me to do a couple movies, so I'm gonna do that. Um, you can uh, also be like our homeboy out there Presley who wants me to do. Um, who wants me to do the man who would be key? He gave me a bunch of options, a bunch of great options. And I think I'm going to start with this one. Um, Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's The Man Who Would Be King. You can uh, smash the like. You can leave me a comment. You can share the video. You can support me in a number of ways. Or, you know, don't forget you can email me. I lost my lighter here. Uh, it's what I do with my lighter. Okay, I lost my lighter, y'all. You can... <laughs> It's only a finite space. It's a finite area. I don't know how I could have lost a cigarette lighter. Hold on one second. Oh. Don't move, baby. Don't move. I'm not going to step on you. There you go. My little baby's down there, my little dog. Okay, I found it. I was sitting on it. <laughs> you can, um, you, don't forget, you guys, you can also uh, get in contact with me um, by... Um, Emailing me at madmaximalism at gmail.com. Madmaximalism with two X's. And uh, you can just uh, 
drop a line like they used to say back in the old days, or like Jim used to say. And um, Jim said in uh, drop a line. What is that? The crystal ship at the end of the song, the crystal ship, right? Drop a line. You can um, ask me questions. Maybe you are a college or grad student and you need help with analysis for a poem. I don't mind doing that. Send me a couple uh send me a couple uh bucks and I'll help you with your analysis. Or just say hello. Say hello. Mad maximalism. Two X's at gmail.com. Um, okay, here we go in the book to the section. I hope the microphone's doing all right, you guys. I'm sorry if it goes in and out, like if I get farther away and close. I'm doing the best I can with it, and I'm trying to fix the levels so that it'll work, you know, when I'm you know, when I'm just I don't have to be right up in the face of this microphone all the time. So please forgive me for my uh my amateur broad my amateur broadcasting skills here. I'm doing the best I can, y'all. Um so we so what happens is Bobby meets this character who is uh, I think he's still talking to Klein here. This guy was, he's a private investigator and he's talking about how he used to work for, they're just sitting in a bar, they're just talking and he's talking about how he um, used to uh, know and work for uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, back in the old days in Chicago. Hey, the Ch Chicago Black Hex game. We're going to get some beard up. Um, it says, this is page... Page, starting with page 333. Oh, 333. Let me make it firm. <laughs> says, I worked with Bobby in Chicago in the early 60s briefly. We were working with a guy named Ed Hicks who was trying to get free elections for the Chicago cab drivers. Basically, Bobby was a, a moralist. Before long, uh, he was to have an amazing roster of enemies, and he prided himself on knowing who they were and what they were up to, which he didn't, of course. By the time his brother was shot a couple of years later, they were mired up in a concatenation of plots and schemos that will never be sorted out. At the head of the list was killing Castro, and if that failed, actually uh, invading Cuba. In the end, I don't think that would have happened, but it's a sort of bellwether for all the trouble they were in. I always wondered if there might not have been a moment there when Kennedy realized he was realized he was dying and that he didn't smile with relief. After old man Kennedy had his stroke, the Joe Kennedy... The Kennedys, for sure, uh, sorry, for some reason, felt that it would be all right to go after the mob. After the mob, ignoring the long-standing deal the old man had cut with them, no idea what they were thinking. All the time, Jack is sh is stooping. He says, uh, "Sam G and Con girlfriend, a lady named Judith Campbell." Although, in all fairness, quaint term, I think that Jack saw her first, or one of his pimps did. Some guy named Sinatra. What are you going to say about the Kennedys? There's no one like them. A friend of mine was at a house party out on Martha's Vineyard, out there on Martha's, one evening. And when he got to the house, Ted Kennedy was greeting people at the door. He was dressed in a bright yellow jumpsuit, and he was drunk. My friend said, that's quite an outfit you got on there. This is page 334 in the book, the Passenger. That you got on there, Senator. And Kennedy said, yes, but I can get away with it. My friend, who's a Washington lawyer, told me that he had never understood the Kennedys. He found them baffling, but he said that when he heard those words, the scales fell from his eyes. He thought they were probably engraved on the family crest, however you say it in Latin. Anyway, I've never understood why there's no monument anywhere to uh, Jerry Moe Kopechny. The girl Ted left to drown his car after he drove off a bridge. If it were not for her sacrifice, that lunatic would have been president. My guess is that with the exception of Bobby, they were just a pack of psychopaths. I suppose it was Bobby's hope that he could somehow justify his family, even though he must have known that this was impossible. There wasn't a copper cent in the coffers that funded the whole enterprise that wasn't tainted. And then they all died, murdered for the most part. Maybe not Shakespeare, but not bad Dostoevsky. Castro was no part of this. But in the end, as it turned out, in the end, as it turned out, he wasn't. When he took over the island, he threw Santo Traficante in jail and told him that he was going to be shot as an enemy of the people. So, of course, Traficante said, how much? You hear different figures. 40 million, 20 million is probably closer to 10. But Traficante wasn't happy about it. The mob had a long history of running the casinos for Batista. Castro should have treated them better, the mob. He's lucky to be alive. The odd thing is that Santo ran three casinos in Cuba for another eight or ten years after that. Language is important. People forget that Traficante's first language is Spanish. Anyway, he and Marcello have run the Southeast from Miami to Dallas for years, and the net worth of this enterprise is staggering. At its height, over $2 billion a year. Bobby Kennedy wouldn't have deported Marcello without Jack's okay, but by now the whole business was beyond disentanglement. CIA hated Kennedy. 
Kennedys and were working and cutting themselves loose from the administration altogether. But the notion that they that they killed him is stupid. And if Kennedy was going to take the uh, take them apart piece by piece, as he promised to do, he'd have to start about two administrations sooner. But this time it was way too late. They hated Hoover, too, and Hoover in turn hated the Kennedys, and people just assumed Hoover was in bed with the mob, but the truth was the mob had endless files on on him as a um, beautiful and stunning, brave citizen, let's say, uh, dressed in certain clothes. So that was a Mexican standoff that had been in play for years. There's more to it, of course, but if you said that Bobby had gotten his brother, whom he adored, kilt, I would have to say that's pretty much right. CIA hauled Carlos off to the jungles of Guatemala and flew away, waving back at him. Hard to imagine what they were thinking. They left him there, where he had held a counterfeit passport. And his lawyer finally showed up, and then the two of them were frog-marched off into the jungles of El Salvador and left to fashion now new lives for themselves. Standing there in the heat and the mud and the mosquitoes, dressed in wool suits, they hiked some 20 miles until they came to a village. And God be praised the telephone. When he got back to New Orleans, he called a meeting at Churchill Farms, his country place, and he was foaming at the mouth over Bobby Kennedy. He looked at the people in the room. I think there were eight of them. And he said, I'm going to whack that little bastard. And it got very quiet. Everybody knew it was a serious meeting. There was nothing on the table to drink but water. And finally somebody said, why don't we whack the big bastard? And that was that. I'm not sure I understand, he says. Uh, if you killed him, then you had really pissed off the big, the brother, to deal with. But if you killed him, then his brother went, pretty quickly from being the Attorney General of the United States to being an unemployed lawyer. How do you know all this? Right. So, do you get what they're saying here? Um, they're saying that essentially this guy is saying, and now this is fiction, right? Probably fiction rooted in reality, certainly truthful in a number of ways, is that uh, what they're saying is that this guy's like, yeah, I worked with um, Bob Kennedy back in the day, and that the real reason for the big JFK event was to get rid of Bob because of how Bob went after the uh, the Goombas, right? And a lot of this makes sense, but um, I think it's a little, you know, of course, the we're not supposed to take everything they say as fact. I mean, and it's a little, um, I think it's a little off the mark in a number of ways. I don't think it's, I don't think it's probably too prudent or uh, appropriate to say what, you know, what I think or what we think. I mean, we could probably much figure, but I think he was wrong on that one big point about the, the big thing, um, doing the big thing. I think that that was essentially part of it. Um, but, you know, everybody's always. I love that he's talking here about the mob. Uh, in the sense that 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 is a big role, especially in the Oliver Stone film. Remember that plays a huge role in it, and you know that that. You know, I've got this book up here, uh, Plausible Denial by Mark Lane. That's a pretty good book if you want to dive into it. Um, they also dive into it in uh, The Ghost of Langley by Prados and in um, Devil's Chessboard by La by um, Alan Dulles. And, but, he, but what he goes on to say is that they had a number of different... Uh, first of all, the files on it, there are like millions of files... And, um, you know, it, there's so much to it, and that's mainly because of all the files that the other um, groups, the other intel agencies had on the same thing. They recently asked uh, old Pooty Poot about that, and remember, he, he said his thing. Um, but, of course, they had files on it, and that's all part of the files on the files. But what he goes on to say is, uh, on page 335, right, the thing about the Kennedys was that they had no way to grasp the uh, the inappeasable war ethic of the Sicilians. The Kennedys were Irish, and they thought they had won by talking. They didn't really even understand that this other thing existed. That's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a misstatement, <laughs> to say the least. They used abstractions to make political speeches. The people, poverty, asked not what your country, blah blah blah. They didn't understand that there were still people alive who actually believed in things like honor. We believe in things like honor, code, right. What's that from? A few good men? I love that speech. They'd never heard Joe Bonanno on the subject. That's what makes Kennedy's book so preposterous. Although, in all fairness, there's some question as to whether or not he even read it. Um, says, let's see. Um, that's about it. That's about it as far as that goes. Their little tangent into the uh, JFK event. Um, 
Yeah, sister went to University of Chicago uh, at age 13. That's mentioned on page 361. Um, okay, getting to the end of the book here, page 380. This is a great McCarthyan passage. Uh, a small mule danced in a flowered field. He stopped to watch it. It rose on its hind legs like a satyr and sawed its head about. It whinnied and hauled its rope and kicked, and it stopped and stood splay-footed and stared at Western and then went hopping and howling. It had browsed through a nest of wasps, but Western didn't know how to help it, and when he went on, he found a coin on the beach, an ill-formed disc of bronze washed all but barren by the centuries. He put it in his pocket. Put it in your pocket. Put it in your pocket. But I don't know what I'm calling for. Put it in your pocket. I found a coin. I found an old Roman coin on the beach. Put it in your pocket. Do you get do you get the symbolism though of the coin? I mean, it's obviously we get this intertextuality with No Country for All Men, but the but the coin is also and there's a flip side to that coin. What if you do got me boxed in? I got a woman, right? Uh, the coin is like the flip coin, the Janus coin, looking backwards and forwards in life. It's also the coin of his Gemini sister, right? There's two sides to the coin. It's also the dialectic in terms of, of the choices that he makes in life, but he never chooses the right choice that supersedes the coin in the first place. But it's also Western is like, you know, going into Western is this character, Bobby Western, and he symbolizes like the Western night, right? And he's looking at the far shore of the edge of the country into the outer dark and the wreckage of life. And if you look far enough west, then you see the east where his father did all this stuff and caused this, this destruction. Um, it's also a remnant of the past. He finds it washed up on the shore. It's a remnant of his past, which is his sister and his, his, li his own life and his own choices. Um, let's see, it says, the weather had warmed and on these nights he'd strip out of his clothes and leave them folded over his sandals on the beach and wade out into the soft black water and dive and swim out beyond the slow lope of the surf and turn and loll on his back in the swells and watch the stars where some few came adrift of their moorings and drop down that vast midnight hall from dark to dark. He'd no photograph of her. He tried to see her face, but he knew he was losing her. He thought that some stranger not yet born might come upon her photo in a school album in some dusty shop and be stopped in the place by her beauty. Turn back the page. Look again in those eyes, a world at once antique and never to be. After she left the quarry, he sat alone until the small flames in their tins had guttered out one by one, then just the dark of the countryside, the silence of it, the faint drone of a truck out on the highway. He wrote in his little black book by the light of the oil lamp. The little black book, the little black book he's writing in is similar to the little black book of death into which the uh, the kid, the thalidomide kid, is writing the sins of the, of the sister, of Alicia, or at least the sins of what she perceives as this generational curse. Mercy is the province of the person alone. There is mass hatred and there's mass grief, mass vengeance, and even mass suicide. But there is no mass forgiveness. There's only you. We pour water upon the child and name it, not to fix it in our hearts, but in our clutches. The daughter of men sit, daughters of men sit in half darkened closets, inscribing messages upon their arms with razor blades, and sleep is no part of their life. After the long, dry summer had passed, he woke one night to see the high window in the wall of the grain mill appear out of the darkness. And then again, he sat in the window and watched out there beyond the blackest reaches of the sea, the soundless thunder and the shuddering light beyond the rimlet clouds. And then it ends. It says, Late one evening, he saw before him on the beach a small figure cloaked against the cold. He quickened his step, but it was merely, it was only an old woman walking on the beach. Scarcely four feet tall, he passed her and wished her a good evening, and then he stopped and asked her if she was all right, and she said that she was. She said that she was going to visit her daughter, and he nodded and went on. He knew that he still hoped for that small and half-forgotten figure to fall in beside him. Leaning into the salt wind with his hands in his pockets and in his clothes flapping, he'd seen him one final time in a dream. He'd seen the kid, the thalidomide kid, God's own mudlark, trudging, cloaked, and muttering the barren selvage of some nameless desolation where the cold sidereal sea breaks and seethes and the storms howl in front, in from out of that black and heaving alkahest. 
trudging the shingles of the universe, his thin shoulders turned to the stellar winds and the suck of alien moons dark as stones, a lonely shore loper hurrying against the night, small and friendless and brave. He climbed into the loft and sat at the tower window, wrapped in his blanket, spits of rain on the sill, summer lightning far out to sea, like the flare of, some, of distant f field pieces. The patter on the tarp he'd stretched over his bed. He turned up the wick of the lamp at his elbow and took the notebook from its box and opened it. Then he stopped. He sat for a long time. In the end, she had said, there will be nothing that cannot be simulated. And this will be the final abridgment of privilege. This is the world to come, not some other. The only alternate is the surprise in this antic shapes buried into the concrete. The antic shapes buried into the concrete are, of course, the burned images of the bomb that their father has created and when she says when she says that there's no other world that's because she is lost this girl is lost i'm sorry to yeah sorry to yell folks she is lost she's lost because she's she's gone now right but she's lost because she feels like she can create this other world that she can be this sophia principle creating but as part of this new this sort of neo-gnostic eden but because she thinks that's sort of what her dad has done, but he's sort of created this postmodern fractured devil world, in a sense. That's their that's their um, that's their transhumanist Eden, right? Is this fractured devil world in the midst of this abyss in the outer dark, the ages of men stretching grave to grave, blood, darkness, the stone lament. Laminations of the world with their fossil prints, unreckonable in form and number. My father's latter-day petroglyphs and the people upon the road naked and howling. The storm passed and the dark sea lay cold and heavy and the cool metallic waters, the hammered shapes of great fishes, the reflection in the swells of molten bolide trundling across the firmament like a burning train. Finally, he leaned and cupped his hand to the glass chimney and blew out the lamp and laid back in the dark. He knew that on the day of his death he would see her face and he could hope to carry that beauty into the darkness with him, the last pagan on earth, singing softly upon his palate in an unknown tongue. I think that the, I find that the image of the old woman and then also the vision of the, uh, the, the thalidomide kid remind me of the Weird sisters traversing the beach uh, before the start of the battle in Macbeth. And in a sense, we do have this kind of, um, this sort of um, un unification of opposites here with, my, what does my note say? My note says, Macbethian image, the one weird sister wandering the long beach before the crest of the war wave. Right, because remember in Macbeth we have the three, Weird sisters, the three fates wandering the beach and presenting and, and, and you know, prophesying and, and creating through their magic, through, Im through imitative magic, what will happen, which is the meaning of Macbeth at the dawn of the new era after the war and the sacrifice of war in Macbeth, right? And... And here we just have this one woman, this one weird sister, this one weird woman, who's also kind of supplanted in the image by the thalidomide kid. And yeah, this could yeah this could be a kind of a yeah Christopher says a foreshadowing or time opposed. I mean, a foreshadowing. It's interesting that it's foreshadow because the shadow plays such an uh, an important you know imagistic role in this in this like work of prose the the parts of the book that function as a kind of a prose poem which is that the shadow is the shadow burned into the concrete or the shadow of the of the sun on humans you know sh showing your your shade your other side your in or your inner self in terms of the life of the characters in the book or the shadow of his sister and his dad that fall over the character which, you know, as Shakespeare said in The Tempest, the past is prologue in terms of what these characters do and their choices. Um, the other, there are a couple of other passages that are so brilliant in this. Um, one is uh, the description of Oak Ridge on page 175, the Oak Ridge facility, because they go into how their parents met. His mom was a local and his dad came from out of town, just like McCarthy came from out of town. Uh, into Tennessee himself. 
lived in uh, Knoxville. I gave it to an old airman named Wanaki. Hit in an old coffee can in Knoxville, Tennessee. This watch, he give me the watch. Um, says on page 175, um, he lay in the little room listening to the wind outside, uh, outside the house. He shut the door to the hallway and there was no heat in the room and it got pretty cold. His mother was 19 when she went to work at Y12, the electromagnetic separation plant, one of the three processes for the separation of the uranium-235 isotope. The workers were driven out to the compound in buses, bumping over the rough graded road through dust and or mud given the weather. Talking was not allowed. The barbed wire fencing ran for miles and the buildings were of solid concrete, massive things, monolithic, and for the most part windowless. They sat in the great selvage of raw mud beyond which lay a perimeter of the wrecked and twisted trees that had been bulldozed from the site. She said it looked as if they had just somehow emerged out of the ground, the buildings. There was no accounting for them. She looked at the other women on the bus, but they seemed to have abandoned themselves, and she thought that she might be the only one of them that, while she did not know what this was all about, knew all too well that it was godless and that while it had poisoned back to elemental mud all living things upon the ground, yet it was far from being done. It was just the beginning. Beginning. There's your foreshadowing, right? Because they're creating, they're, they are in the midst of creating, they're creating destruction, right? How's that for an oxymoron? The monolithic and the elemental mud. Um, let's see. Also, we have, oh, Western admits on page 175 that the robbery that occurred was probably not a simple, you know, cat burglar break in. It was more likely, it was more likely elements from the, you know, black bag operators or Department of, of, of E lifting files. Um, let's see. Oh, we had, uh, interesting, we had a mention of the name of the ship, one of the rigs that Bobby goes out to is the Caliban Beta. We just did, we just did temp, the Tempest. Um, we've got, uh, I think it's Al Crowley mentioned on page 245. Um, he says, let's see. Um, let me find this part. He says Crowley. Montrachet. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, decamped, flown the coop, 244. It's hard to keep them entertained, Squire. They, they keep upping the ante. Um, let's see. The ancients claim that there is a truth in the grape. God knows I've looked, I suppose, that when a man is sick of uh, a woman, he's sick of life, but I do think the uh, women may have finally done me in, God, but we're fools for something that should be delivered with the morning milk, as Crowley would have it. And then a couple of other things. Um, on pages 142 and 143, there's a great passage here where it says, Oh, oh, they talk about poetry again on page um, 137C. Uh, yeah, page 147C. Sorry about that. I don't know what that was. Um, it says, I think you've some idea. Where is all this going? I think you've, I've got no idea. I think you've got some idea. I know that you think we're different, me and thee, which is, Bar which is Berryman esque language. We mentioned John Berryman earlier. Um, my father was a country storekeeper and yours a fabricator of expensive devices that make a loud noise and vaporize people. But our common history transcends much. I know you. I know certain days of your childhood, all but weeping with lon loneliness, coming upon a certain book in the library and clutching it to you, carrying it home, some perfect place to read it, under a tree perhaps, besides a, beside a stream, flawed youths, of course, to prefer a world of paper, rejects. But we know about truth, don't we, Squire? And of course it's true that any number of these books were penned in lieu of burning down the world, which was, the, which was their author's true desire. It's interesting, talking about sort of a self-referential or talking about poets and talking about really the the kind of archetypal destructive language of McCarthy himself as the author, right? Writing books in lieu of burning down the world. 
Um, on page 143. Let's see. Let me find this one part. Um, but I will tell you, Squire, that having read even a few dozen books in common is a force more binding than blood. And it says, I think it's because people are bored out of their, out of their effing minds. I could come up with anything else, and there may be there may be something contagious about it. Certainly, there are mornings when I wake and see a grayness to the world I think was not in evidence before. A conversation we've had. I know the horrors of the past lose their edge, and in the doing, they blind us to a world careening toward a darkness beyond the bitterest speculation. I'm. It's sure to be interesting when the onset of universal night is finally acknowledged as irreversible, even the coldest cynic will be astonished at the celerity with which every rule and stricture shoring up this creaking edifice is abandoned and every aberrancy embraced. It should be quite a spectacle. How brief. I think that's a good place to end it because that really, that, that paragraph really, really encapsulates the kind of postmodern ethos, doesn't it? Um, which is a take on the fracture, fracturing of the world. And it's always with this sense of a kind of metaphysical apocalypticism, right, which is a careening toward a darkness that no one can comprehend um, is their worldview in the book. But again, the, pro <laughs> the problem with all this is that there seems to be so much hubris, right? There seems to be so much hubris in these characters and in these people and they don't there's there's this lack of humility where oftentimes it's the simplest truth right which is um which is um you know pray right um so i think that i mean even, maybe i'll read one more which is the um page 368 which is the uh, description of the of the, um, the Trinity test site because it talks about what their father felt when he set off the uh, the big one. He spoke little to them of Trinity. Mostly, he read it in the literature, lying face down in the bunker, their voices low in the darkness. Two, one, zero. Then the sudden white meridian. Out there, the rocks dissolving into a slag that pulled over the melting sands of the desert. Small creatures crouched aghast in that sudden and unholy day, and then there were no more. What appeared to be some vast, violet-colored creature rising out of the earth, where it had thought to sleep its deathless sleep and waited its hours, its hour of hours. Um, which is the kind of, uh, which is a kind of Yeatsian second coming image, right? Um, and they talk about seeing the birds catching fire and falling to the to the earth like you know in, in arcs of burning light, which is a, a truly a, a a kind of a symbolic Luciferian image of the destruction that the, that they've created that these characters in the book are trying to come to terms with and that um, that makes its way like a gargantuan dark figure blooming out of explosive dust. Leveling, leveling their psyches in the broken landscape of postmodernism. So that's about all I got, you guys. Um, that was an analysis of The Passenger by Cormac McCarthy. I look forward to, you know, in the future seeing some more um, deep analyses of this book. I'm sure they will come. Um, and then, of course, I'm sure I'll pick up the, the second book, Stella Maris, when it comes out in December. But... Um, Hey, we're a literature channel, and you know we've done the best we could with an analysis of this newest McCarthy, which is um, leading up to the coda of his works. I'm sure, you know, this guy. I mean, he's he's almost 90 years old, so you know, pray he lives a. I'd say he lives a long life. He's lived a long life, but he keeps living a long time longer. And um, but you know, it, it's interesting to be in a time when you know this this uh, great American writer is reaching the. Um, the, the climax of his work, certainly. And so I think that's uh, it's, it's interesting, and I'm glad that we were able to uh, read the book right when it came out. You know, it came out 10 days ago, so we've already done an analysis on it, so I think that's good. Uh, you know, we did what we could. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Um, we've got, let's see, uh, I think JD is starting up 
in a minute. He's going to be doing his stream over at Jay's Analysis. Shouts out to Jay's Analysis. Um, and shouts out to all our homies out there. Shouts out to uh, Church of the Eternal Logos, our good friend, um, who came on um, to our stream doing the Caddyshack stream last week. That was really fun. Shouts out to uh, Jerry also for coming on and to uh, Maddie. Um, I'd love to be on um, Maddie, you know, if we want to get a panel with our homeboys going and, and talk about stuff, that'd be cool. Uh, if you guys want to see um, anybody on the channel, like, for instance, if you want to see JD on the channel, if you want to get him over here and, and lend his um, expertise to an analysis, then um, let him know. Uh, and if you want to share the stream, I really appreciate, you know, you guys sharing the stream. Um, share it with your friends and family if they, uh, you know, want to listen, listen to us talk about literature. And thank you to all my homeboys out there. Thank you especially to uh, Kristen. Oh, go to um, Kristen Slowboy Whiteboard at her new channel, which is um, Crunchy Jackson. It's Crunchy Jackson. Slowboy Whiteboard. Look up her channel. Um, love you out there, homegirl. Shouts out to Jethro, our our best friend here and our wonderful, beautiful mod. Thank you so much to Jethro for uh, holding it down here for us. Thank you to all our friends and all of our family. Um, thank you to everybody that dropped a super chat. Let me look one more time just to make sure I got everybody um, and that I read everybody out. And forgive me if I missed one. Oh, shouts out to Alan also. Thank you, Alan, for dropping that um, $5 PayPal before the stream started. Thank you so much, homeboy. Really appreciate you. Um, and let's see. Yes. So again, shouts out to Genghis for that $20 super chat. Appreciate you. Shouts out to Randy for that $1 super chat. Didn't leave a message. Thank you for that $1. Thank you too. And I appreciate that. Listen, I appreciate the $1. I appreciate the $20 and I appreciate your hard earned bucks out there. I really do. Thank you. Thank you to Valentine, uh, for that five bucks. Valentine said, hold on. Let me see if I can click this. Um, Valentine said, if I can read this, it won't let me read it. I'm not bragging, folks, but Bay's Lit is the, I can't read the rest of the message. Why won't it let me? Um, thank you to, thank you to, oh, wait, hold on. Forgive me, y'all. I'm a, I'm a, kind of a, I'm kind of slow with this. Mm, it's not letting me read the message. Why aren't you letting me read it? Thanks, thanks to uh, Maddie for that $5 super chat and question earlier. Really appreciate you, as always. Shouts out to Pim. Um, thanks to Cade. Does not let me read the message. Come on now. I don't know why. So I'm sorry about that. I will try to read the whole message next time. Thanks again to Valentine for that five bucks. Um, shouts out to... Yes, and then let me check one more time. It's not letting me read the message. That's annoying. Um, not my fault. And then let me check one more time. Just before we go, I just want to make sure I get everybody's support and messages in here. Uh, oh, look at that. Kristen, our homegirl, sends five bucks. Thank you so much, Kristen. Really appreciate you. As always, you are so awesome. Love you so much. Thank you. And then, yes, and shouts out to Alan for that five bucks on PayPal. Kristen set five bucks on Cash App. Really appreciate you. And I think, I think that's it. So thank you all for your generous support and your love. Um, I will see you guys next time. I'll be back soon because it's not going to take me long to um, uh, get into this, um, this uh, man who would be king analysis. So we're going to do that. And I think that's about it, y'all. Um, I'll see you guys over at JD, over at Jay's Analysis. And I will see y'all later.